All right, everyone, welcome to session two. It is Wednesday, February 21st. It's about 6.20 p.m. Central Time. A uh, lot less talking as far as slides tonight. There's only a handful of them. We'll get through them, and then we'll start to get to our first challenges of the course. All right, so uh, the REPL intro, we've already uh, talked about REPL, right? So uh, the run button is still up there at the top. We've got the console. Uh, the shell, which we don't really use for much of anything. And then we've got the interface, which is the index.js uh, that will do all of our coding in here and all of our output shows up over here. Uh, let's see here. So we kind of, we like I said, we've already seen all of this. Uh, we talked about, uh, this is a single line comment. Uh, I didn't show you specifically how to do a multi-line comment. Um, but you can do that with, a, instead of the double slash, it's a slash and an asterisk, and then an asterisk and a slash, and everything in between becomes a comment. Uh, we get variable names. Uh, we get the color coordination, right? So this is a protected word. This is the name of our variable. This is us assigning a value, and then this is the value, which is a string. And we get the different colors. It's trying to help us out. Um, we don't want to use var, we want to use letter const. And if we want something to show up over here in the console, we have to log it to the console. All right. And so this is, again, a this is the new way of doing a function. This is the old way of doing a function. And formatting and clean code. All right. So proper formatting of code, if you remember anything, just be consistent. Proper variable names, descriptive naming, the name of the variable should make it clear what the data represents. Uh, in JavaScript, uh, I didn't say it explicitly, but we do use camel case, all right? So camel case, the first letter of the first word is lowercase, the entire first word is lowercase, and then the first letter of each word after that is going to be uppercase, all right? And then proper indentation and spacing, Again, I didn't really talk about this, but I was kind of doing it automatically when I was going through there. So that's pretty much it for the slides for session two. So let's go ahead. I'm going to open up a, a notes here for session two. And let's see. So we'll go node. Uh, one four session two notes. And let's go ahead and create our REPL. All right, and like I said, there's always little tweaks going on uh, with Replit. They're always trying to make it a little bit better. Um, they, let's see here. Okay. So they have, uh, they used to actually have a button that you had to hit to do some formatting. But if anyone noticed that, right? So if I write a line of code and I am all the way out at the global scope, I'm not inside of a function, I'm not inside of a conditional statement or a loop, I should be all the way to the left, right? And then I did a couple of tabs over and when I saved my file uh, over here, you can see formatting, um, it said formatter, formatting index.js with prettier, format, uh, formatting completed. Prettier is a, so what we call linting. And linting is pr and programming is literally just um, cleaning up and making everything look uniform, right? There, there's a limit to linting, right? So normally in my code, I wouldn't put two spaces between something. Right, and if I if I save it, it's going to lint. Oh, and actually, it took the extra space out. Okay, so they've got their their settings cranked up on this, and so we'll we'll see exactly what it does and doesn't do. But same thing, like if I were to write an if statement, right? So when I hit enter, it's automatically
right? It is automatically pushing my text one indent indentation in, right? Which is appropriate. So same thing if I write a function, right? It, it put me in one indentation. All right, so now if I save this again, if I take this and do this, and if I push that one out and notice how these letters are all kind of crammed together. So if I do this, like none of this will break my code in JavaScript, right? Like the machine will still run it. However, this is bad formatting and my linter is going to save me from myself. So let's go ahead and save it, right? And it fixed all of these little oddities in my code. Now, I recommend, and you do that, and I don't know if it will do it. Let's see here, if I hit run. Okay, so it doesn't do it when you hit run. So you actually have to save it. So on a Mac, Command S, and if you're on a PC, I'm going to guess Control S. Uh, we'll actually save it and then run the format, right? And you should be doing that frequently. You write a line or two of code, go ahead and run it. Um, and I kind of I had talked to you guys about um, like I use I don't use a replet like in my day to day work. I use a uh, an actual IDE called Visual Studio Code. And so when I do that and I'm inside Visual Studio Code doing my, my real work, I will um, like every time I click on a different window, um, every time I copy and paste something in, it saves my code automatically for me and runs that formatting for me so that it's, it's just running constantly and I don't let it build up and become a mess. <laughs> All right, so just to cover a, uh, well, let's see here. So here is this, um, the, the formatting has gotten better, uh, much better since the last time I taught this class. And if you didn't pick it up, there was also something else subtle that happened. Uh, so look at when I do this and I'm gonna save, All right? Look at A and B here, right? So they're dark gray and they've got little squiggly lines under them. So if I hold my mouse over it, it says A is a declared value, but it is never read. Um, uh, Andrew, so ESLint is uh, there for JavaScript, there's probably five or six different linters. I actually use prettier inside VS Code as well. Uh, and for anyone that's starting to uh, do things with VS Code, uh, not, most of it is not built in automatically, but you have extensions. So and it supports multiple languages, but so like I've got Prettier installed, right? And so if I open up a JavaScript file, I'll see Prettier pop up down here and it'll give me my different options and I can click on it and fire it off or see what's going on or um, if you go in and uh, edit some of the default settings in here, like so you change it to your default formatter and then um, there should be like format on save is false. If you say uh, format on save is true, like every time you save your file to automatically run it and fix everything for you, which is, is a good, good thing to do. All right, so this again is our IDE trying to help us out. Right, so it's telling me, hey, you've got this parameter here, but you're not actually using it for anything yet, right? And so when I re write my return statement and I say return, and as soon as I hit A, right, it lights up, it's not underlined anymore because now I'm actually using it. Same thing, I do B, and now I'm, I'm good to go, right? So everything's been set up. So I can say, and we talked about this on Monday as well, right? So my function, so if I hit run, I, I get this console.log up here, but nothing happens with this function because I haven't told it to do anything yet, 
right? And to tell it to do something, I have to call my function. So if I say add numbers, and I say uh, five and 10, and I run it, right? I still don't see anything over here, but it added together the numbers five and 10 and returned 15. If I wanna see it in my console, I have to send it to my console. And the way to do that is to wrap this statement in a console.log statement, right? So now when I run it, there's my 15. Remember, strings will show up white over here. An actual number will be gold, uh, the string of a number. So if I do, Seventy-five in quotes, right? It's a string representation of a number that's white. If I do a boolean value, right, my boolean value changes color over here. It shows up. It doesn't show up like if I did uh, true in a string, right? So if I do that instead of it being gold, I'll see it show up white over here. Okay, and so these are all different ways that my environment is trying to help me keep my my information organized. All right, so make sure that you're leaning on it and you're taking advantage of it. You know, something is not working out quite the way you think it is. That's always a good way to help guide yourself as you're debugging. Uh, one thing I will say right now that I don't like uh, with this formatting, and uh, maybe I'll dig into it later, um, it's adding semicolons for me at the ends of some of these lines. This is not necessary uh, in modern JavaScript. You do not need a semicolon at the end of your line. And every, prof every professional project I've ever uh, worked on, we actually set our linting to delete them. So even if someone like put a semicolon at the end of the line, when they save it, our linter will go through and delete all of those unneeded semicolons because it's just an extra character. You don't need it. All right. And so let's see here. Let's let's cover um, we'll we'll cover functions, loops, and um, control flow here. Well, while we've got it again, we're just going to go over it again, right? So there's multiple different ways to write a function, right? So this is the old way of doing it, right? And so that's add numbers. Right, and that's kind of the only thing we've done in a function so far, but we could also do something where, uh, let's say function, uh, let's say greeting, right? And we'll say uh, name and time of day, right, as parameters. And so then we can uh, return and remember back ticks. So if I do quotes or single quotes, I've got a string. If I do back ticks, I've got a string literal. So I could say Right, and so if I run this, so hello, Andrew, and see how I missed the space here, right? Like this is how I normally write it. You're not used to writing a sentence by putting a leading empty space in it. Uh, I hope you are having a good evening. And again, need a space right here to make this work, right? Hello, Andrew, I hope you are having a good evening. And so to me, I do not like concatenating strings like this. You have to remember to put all these spaces in. I like it quite a bit better when I use string literals and I do something like this, where I say, right? 
right? So we get the exact same effect, but I don't have to add all these extra quotes in here and remember to do this weird spacing. It's like you're just typing a normal sentence, right? So when you're concatenating a string, I generally lean towards doing a string literal instead of just adding all of these plus signs, right? Now, the other part of that, so that's the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is instead of doing it as a function, we do it as a let. Uh, and then say, uh, what was say? Right, same thing here. Those went from dark gray to light gray as we were using them. Let's go ahead and save it. We'll clean up our code, get our spaces in there. Let's run it. All right, and there's my 25. That's what I'm expecting. Now notice that this 25 is above this and this, right? So even though I'm writing these functions in this order, I've been putting their calls in the reverse order. So it doesn't matter where the function shows up in your code versus where you actually call your function and use it. That's what determines how they're the order of operation. So all of these functions are recognized and loaded into the program, but nothing happens until you call them. Right. And then they are all reusable. So I can reuse it over and over and over again. Right. So uh, I have a console.log. There's a function. There's a function. There's a function. And then there's that first function again, again, again. And then some more console.logging. All right. Now, where you get into trouble is if let's see here, this should, if I put the function call above it, uh, with the old style, will this blow it up? Nope, it won't blow it up, so it hoists it. Okay, what if I change this to a const, and then I do this. All right, so there's with that, and will it do it with a let? Yep, so it hits it. So with the old style function, it gets hoisted, which is not a concept you need to spend a lot of time on, is that when you, hoisting is basically everything gets loaded and then sent to the top by the machine. Even though you see the code down here, it takes all the variables, all the functions, and it basically moves it to the top of its scope, which is, the, the global scope, this whole thing. And then it starts asking what's going on. With a const or a let, uh, it does not do that. Uh, and basically you can't access it before the code is actually written, All right? Now, that being said, if you sent me code like this and I had to review it, I would send it back to you and tell you to organize it and keep all of your functions, like, so all of your functions, all of your variables, and then all of your function calls in one spot and in that order, right? So like, that is just, again, keeping it as clean code, right? So if I wanted to clean this up, I would do something that looks like this, and I get rid of this, get rid of the extra spaces in here, right? And this is, more or less what I would be looking for, right? Like I don't wanna see function calls above the functions that they're written for because you it'll help you avoid running into issues like this. All right, any questions on anything I've uh, covered in the review so far? Go for it. Uh, so for the let object, the multiply numbers, is there a difference? Or what does the equal sign, greater sign mean? Uh, is that just turning it into a let function? Yes. So that is the new syntax 
Um, so this is called a fat arrow function. So that equal and then greater than sign is a, basically they call it a fat arrow in JavaScript. Gotcha. And so, and the other reason why, like I'm showing you both of them, but if this makes you uncomfortable and you need to write a function, just write it this way. Like, like I said, it's not gonna knock any points off an application. No one's gonna yell at you about it. When you get to a project, they'll probably have you write them all one way or all the other way. And then they want them all written the same way throughout the code base, just so it stays consistent. But right now it's it's your choice how you want to tackle it. I do, and, and again, while you're learning, I recommend this because with a function, right? So if we do function, right? So this function, has no parameters, right? Like we're not feeding anything into it. So when I call it, the only thing I have to do is do example function and that, right? So there, there's my function. That's the only thing I need to do. Let's cut these out and cut that out. And when I run this, right, I just get hello. Now, this is, it has one parameter, this has two parameters, this has three parameters, right? And you can keep going, like technically you can stuff a, a ton of parameters in, but it's better not to. Like if you've got a function that's taking more than three parameters, you should look at maybe needing to write uh, two different functions. Uh, the, and all of this gets written the same way, right? Like nothing had to change except for the fact that I was putting params in here. And when I write a new new style function, so if I say let and if I have no params, I have to do that, right? So, Right, I run it, they're they're both running. Right. Now, if I will only put one param in here, right, there notice that those parentheses go away. And then if I want multiple params, I have to put the parentheses back in place. Right. And so writing a uh, the that new the new style function, there's a little bit more to remember depending on what you're doing and how many params you have versus writing the old style. The old style, you can just keep writing it the same way over and over again. Uh, it's good to start experiencing both and seeing both. But like I said, if one of like, if and this, for whatever reason, uh, makes people more uncomfortable, um, then that's fine. Just stick to the style that you're comfortable with while you're learning. Any other questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and we'll do uh, a loop here real quick. So remember, um, we have while loops, for loops. Right, those are the two most important loops that you'll learn. Uh, we also have like for in for of
All right. Excuse me. And we didn't talk about it. We'll talk about it more, but there's also dot map and dot for each. These are built-in methods. All right. I want you to avoid using a dot map or using a dot for each until you're comfortable writing for and while loops. The reason being is these rely on callback functions. They're confusing and they're, uh, well, I should say they're confusing until you get the hang of them. And they're super confusing if you don't understand how a for loop or a while loop actually works behind the scenes. Right. So until you look at a problem and say, oh, I for sure need a for loop that does this, this, and this, don't concern yourself with trying to uh, leverage a dot map or a dot for each. Why you would do this in professional code is because it takes a lot less actual code to write one of these than it does to write a for or a while loop, but it takes away from that structure that we demonstrated and that we're gonna go over again, and it can make it more difficult to understand, especially if you don't like this new, um, like the new uh, ECMA 6 uh, format and the fat arrow functions. Um, these rely on a callback function uh, with like the fat arrow format. And until you understand how those like basic mechanical loops work, it's just best to avoid these altogether because you're just adding an extra layer of confusion there. All right. So remember, we looked at a while loop. So we could say let A equal uh, 10, or I'm sorry, we'll say zero. And we'll say while A is less than 10. And we say console.log A. And on, um, Monday, we just did a, we did um, a equals a plus one. All right. So now there's a couple of different ways to do this, right? So this is the long way to do it. Uh, you can also do a plus equals one, right? So this will do the same thing, All right? There's my zero through nine. So I could also turn this into a one and I could say less than or equal to, and then we're counting from one to 10, right? Um, I can also count by twos if I want to, right? So one, three, five, seven, nine, because the next one would be 11. So we never hit that one. Um, you could do it by multiplication. You can, you can do it by halves if you want to. So there's different ways to increment and decrement. You could also do it this way. So I could say 10 and as long as a is greater than or equal to zero and then say a minus equals one, right? And now I'm counting backwards, but you just have to make sure that you're heading in the direction of your condition that you're giving it, because if you're not, you're just creating an infinite loop and it'll just keep going forever and ever, right? Because if I did um, A starts at 10 and keep going as long as A is greater than or equal to zero and I start adding, right? Like I'm gonna start counting and I'm just gonna keep going forever, right? Like I've written an infinite loop and this number will, slowly keep increasing until I run my replit out of virtual memory and then the whole thing will crash and it'll tell me there's a there's been a stack overflow. All right. So I just manually stopped it. <clears throat> now there's also another way we can do this, which is even more shorthand. And we can also do A plus plus, or in this case, if we're still doing it this way, we would do A minus minus. Right. And so when I do that, there's my 10 counting down to zero again, right? So A equals A plus one, A plus equals one, A plus plus, all three of these do the same thing, 
right? And it would be the same thing for this, A equals A minus one, A minus equals one, A minus minus if we're decrement. Right, so we've got lots of, lots of control there, all right? Now, same thing if we do a for loop, we can write the exact same for loop here. This a plus plus. Let's change this back to zero, and we'll say while less than or equal to ten. And so we can do the same thing. So we can say let i, which is our iterator, uh, equal zero. Right. So we're starting at zero. And we're going to keep counting as long as i is less than 10. And then we're going to increment i by 1. right? And technically, I could call this a as well, uh, or ham and cheese sandwich, or whatever you want to do it. But the traditional way to do this is to do i. And if you ever have to write a loop inside of a loop, right? we would just move it to j. Right. And so now we're looping inside of our loop. Uh, well, we haven't gotten there yet. And we can, we'll talk about that. But and then if you've got three loops inside of each other, it's the same thing. You'd go to K. But you also, if you ever run into something where you have to write three loops in, inside of itself, then you, you need to find out a different way to solve the problem. Um, all right. So now we would just say console.log I. And then uh, we do not have to do the incrementing down here because we're incrementing it right there, right? And so there's zero through nine, or sorry, through 10, because we said less or equal to, and then we only went to nine on that one. So now it's the exact same thing, right? So we could say while down here, we'll say four, Oops. Right, so there's our while loop, there's our for loop. The different ways to write it uh, do the exact same thing. Now, where looping will come in handy, and we talked about arrays, and I briefly mentioned that arrays have index values to them. So we can say let array um uh, we'll we'll say we'll just do cats right so we've got four cats Todd Mo Nugget and Nino right humans start counting at one computers start counting at zero All right, so for an array, it has index values. The first element in the array is 0, 1, 2, and 3, all right? So if I want to see just the first element, I need to look at it for the 0 index, all right? So let me just comment these out real quick. And now I can write a for loop that says for let i equal zero, i less than cats dot length. All right. And so notice how it knows what I'm doing with that length. And let's see, give me the there. So gets or sets the length of an array. This is a number one. Uh, this is a number one higher than the highest index in the array. Right, so the index is three, the highest index is three, the length of this is four, right? So console.log cats.length, right, is four. And so what I'm doing in my loop is I'm saying start at zero and keep going, incrementing i as long as it's less than cats.length. So i is zero, i is one, I is two, I is three, and then we exit our loop, right? So I plus plus. And now if I do console.log cat, I see my entire array, all right? Todd, Mo, Nugget, Nino. 
if I want to see one element of it, I can say cats and then give it uh, bracket notation and the index value, and I just see top. And same thing, if I put a three in here, I would expect to just see Nino. There's that. Now, if I wanted to get at each element individually and do something to it, right? So I could say console.log and we'll say, we'll do backticks and we'll say, hello, cats, I. All right. And now what's happening is we are going into the array in the first time through the loop, I is zero. So we're going to say, hi, Todd. And we're going to loop through again. We're going to say, hi, Mo, and so on, right? So if I run this code, right, there is me looping through and accessing each of the elements in that array, right? So I could do the same thing here if I said, uh, well, I'm just going to leave it cats for right now, but I could say 5, 10, 15, 20. And then I could do instead of that, we could say times 10, right? And so now what I would expect to see over here is 50, 100, 150, 200. Right, 50, 100, 150, 200. So I'm accessing each element in the array with my loop and I'm performing some sort of uh, action on it. All right, and so that's that. And let's see here, uh, four, session three, what do we get into? built-in methods, we're going to talk about arrays. Okay, so, all right, cool. I won't get into any of the, too many of the built-in methods for arrays. Let's go ahead, it is 6.56. Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. And so we'll be back, or we'll call it a nine-minute break. We'll be back at 7.05 Central Time. Uh, feel free to throw any questions you have in the chat. We'll answer them when we get back going. And then we'll we'll start getting into some challenges here. All right, everyone, welcome back from the break. It's 7, 12 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we are going to get into our first challenge. So we're going to do first name, last name. And all we're going to do is in that challenge, click on the link. We will see Code Platoon's copy of the problem. We're then going to click Fork and Run. And then we're going to click Fork REPL. And what that does is it actually makes our own personal copy of that code. So I'm over here in the Code Platoon account. I can click on buttons, do whatever. I cannot change this code. I can't edit it. But once I make a fork of the code, this is my code. It's my copy. Everything I, I can do, anything I want to over here. And it has no impact on this over here. And so this is a process that we'll go through for each of the challenges. All right, we've got a comment, we've got a function with a couple of parameters, and then we've got some test stem here. All right, and so we're just console.logging um, and a function call with some parameters in it, and we're saying that it should be equal to this string, right? And right now, if I run it, I get false for all of these because right now I'm not returning anything. So if I were just to do console.log, full name, and let's say we'll do Charles and then Kubiak. Does anyone want to take a guess at what we'll see over here? When I console.log this? It's just your name. Uh, it won't be just my name because I'm not sending my name anywhere. I'm not returning anything out of my function. And if we don't return anything from the function, the function will return undefined. So right now, what the code is actually seeing is, is undefined triple equal to Michael Jordan, right? And this is false. 
right? So this is undefined, this is undefined, 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 right? And so that compared to any of these strings is false. So what we need to do is enter our code in here that uses our params and gives us an output that will change these from false to true. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our prep. So parameters return example and pseudocode. And so for our parameters, we have two params. Both are strings. Okay, and one is a first name. And the other is the last name, right? And I need it to return one string. So it's going to return one string that represents both the first and last name, all right? So we can say example, we'll say C below because we already have some examples written below for us, all right? And now let's talk about our pseudocode. How are we gonna tackle this problem, all right? So I need to make sure that I can, or that I understand what each of my params looks like. I will then want to connect links to params into one string. Right, so this one, excuse me, is pretty straightforward, right? So I just wanna make sure that these are coming through what, they, what I think they are. If they are, then I wanna add them together into one string. And then I need to return that string as output from my function so that I'm no longer returning undefined, and then I'm actually returning a string that resembles what the desired example is. Okay. So first things first, let's just go ahead and console.log first name and last name. All right, let's make sure that I'm typing this in right, I'm getting what I'm expecting, All right? So Michael and Jordan, Tom and Preet, Ada and Lovelace, Charles and Kubiak, right? So I'm getting exactly what I need for those. So now, but notice I am still getting undefined. These are all false, right? So these aren't actually adding up to what they are because we're still just console.logging these and we're not returning them, right? And so we'll get rid of that console.log and we'll turn this into a return statement, right? And if I just did something like return first name plus last name, right? I would expect that this would fail. And let's take a look at why, right? Because I get... Charles Kubiak, right? So it's all smashed together. It doesn't look like this. So I would need to add a space in here, right? So now if I do something like this, I'm guessing that I'm gonna pass, right? So now I've got a true, right? But also I wanna maybe clean this up a little bit and get rid of those unneeded plus signs. So probably what I would do is something like this. Right, and now I've got, I'm accessing my first name, there's my space, I'm ask, accessing my last name, all right? True, true, true. So I passed, all right? And same thing, I'm no longer returning undefined, I'm actually returning the string that I wanna compare against, right? So this is what it would look like when I take out the triple equals and I don't compare it against something. All right? so if I did triple equals, Charles Kubiak, right? Like I should see four trues down, and I do. Oops. <clears throat> All right, so that is the first challenge. Were there any questions on how I went about solving this one?
Okay. So next, let's go ahead. Let's take a look at the next challenge, which is going to be total change view. Okay. Uh, Matthew, I, I see your question. So if you're on the Replit homepage, so if you just go to replit.com, um, are you signed into your account? All right, so to get to where I'm at, you'll need to use one of these links, right? So if I give you, I'll drop this, in the uh, the Slack here, there it is to everybody. There we go. Right. So if I give you that and you click on that, do you get this page? Okay, so now from here, what we need to do is go at the top right, that green button that says fork and run. Then we get the pop-up and then click fork REPL. And now you should get this page and now you have your own copy. And when you look at the top right, you should see your own account profile. All right, and that's how we get to the different challenges. And so, um, yeah, that what Andrew threw in there is the link to the Google Drive so that you can get to here, right? So this folder has the PDF, the bonus challenges, and the challenges we're working through. You can always download these to your own computer if you want to, or you can just access them. I don't delete these after class. So they'll stay here as long as I'm alive and an employee at Copeland. It should be a while for now. Um, and then you get in here, click on any of these links, and it's the same process to, to fork any of those. All right. Now, have uh, has anyone worked ahead and solved this challenge already? And it's, it's okay that you have. I just don't want to stick like three people that have already solved the problem on the same team. So my copy, all right. So the um, so this is total change due. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to work through the prep work with everyone, and then I'm gonna break you out into teams and we'll go over the rules of how uh, we want the teams to work. And I'll probably give you like 15, 20 minutes to solve the problem. And then I'll bring everyone back into the main room and we'll go over a solution together. All right, so it looks like I have two params here, right? So two params, both are numbers, right? So it looks like I could get an integer. It looks like I could get something that's a floating point, right? So the first one is two integers. The second one is an integer, a whole number. The second one is a floating point decimal. Uh, and so I've got some change here. So both numbers represent uh, amount paid and my total cost, all right? And I need to return one number, which is my change. All right, example, we'll say see below again. All right, so same thing as last time.
All right. So I'm dropping some hints here for everyone because this is a, the first time you're going to be doing a challenge on your own. So I want to access both my params to make sure that they uh, that they are what I think they should be, right? So just like I did last time, and I highly encourage you to work through this step by step, just like I did, right? Like console.log amount paid in total costs. Make sure that you're actually getting the numbers fed through the way you want it to. You can write another test down here uh, that looks like something like this, right? Total change, and we'll say uh, 10 and five, right? So that way, when I run it, I'm not just getting true and false, I'm actually seeing what I'm returning out of my function right now. It's undefined because I don't have a return. All right, and then uh, see here, I, I need to process some math. It looks like I could subtract total cost from amount paid to figure out my change due. There is a wrinkle here with floating point numbers in most languages, JavaScript is no exception. I'm not gonna tell you what's gonna happen, but you're gonna see it once you get to it. And then is there a built-in method that could fix this? And will it fix it just in one line of code or is there more than one action that I need to take to actually get my test to pass? All right, so I'm going to grab this. I am going to copy it. I'm going to put it in the chat. So anyone else that wants to copy and paste this into their own fork, you're more than welcome to. All right, so I am going to uh, pause the recording here. Oh, all right, everyone, 7.55 p.m. Central Time. Welcome back from the Total Change Challenge. So I know a couple of the groups got an answer. Uh, so let's go ahead and go over this together and see what we can do here. All right, so like I said, before I send everyone into the breakout rooms, every time we do one of these challenges, and this isn't um, just for uh, like teaching in the class, like I, I want you to do this, even if you're working on a challenge on your own, like steal this little prep block, do this before you take on a challenge, do the actions that I'm teaching, right? Like we're gonna write a little bit of code, we're gonna run it, we're gonna see what we get. We're not gonna try and solve the whole thing in one shot. It doesn't cost any money to click on this button. So we want to click on it as many times as possible. And we want to make small incremental steps towards our final solution. All right, so let's go ahead. First step is I want to make sure that amount paid and total cost are what, what I think they are, all right? So let's go ahead and run it. Yep, so 175, 10, and 728. So that looks good to me. And I know that I need to subtract these. So the next step that I could do here is just uh, take out that comma and let's see what happens when I console.log um, amount paid minus total cost. Right, and so this one looks good. We get that 25 and then this one, we say what the heck happened here and <laughs> basically what it is, and I will, um, uh, throw in, there should be, um, yeah. So I believe this article, uh, kind of goes into it and it explains why it happens. Uh, I'm not going to cover it all right now but I will throw this link in when I post the notes and the video and everything, and I'll include this in here, but this will give you more of a deep dive into why this happens. And it's basically, it's, I believe if I remember correctly, it's because JavaScript uses like a base 12 instead of a base 10 calculation system, which if all of that sounds like gibberish to you, that's fine. You don't need to read it. It's more of, you need to know, that if you're dealing with floating points or if you're dealing with money when you're writing um, in a programming language, you can't, it's not necessarily as simple as you think it'll be each time. Like most languages will have a, uh, like a package, like so JSON or uh, JavaScript uses packages uh, that you download that are pre-written code 
And like, they'll have one that deals explicitly with money and it takes care of all of those rounding errors. So instead of just doing a number minus a number, you'll actually feed it through built-in functions so that you know that you're always getting the, the correct decimal places, which for something like this isn't a big deal. But if you're a bank or an insurance company or you work on the stock market, like all of a sudden, like those decimal places become extremely important. And if anyone's seen office space, like you can see what can happen with small rounding errors when there's you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of tra transactions firing off a day. Okay, so we have a bit of an issue here, right? And so I know that um, I need to basically get rid of all of these trailing decimal points, right? So right, so. Right there, I just Google it. How do I limit decimal places in JS? To limit the number of digits up to two places after a decimal, the two fix method is used, right? This is coming from geeks to geeks. Uh, like I said, I will, you mean you can use these, there's W3, but what I'm looking for is I almost always want to go to MDN web docs, all right? And it says, the, the two fix method of a number of value formats or values formats the number using fixed point notation. All right. Now let's take a look at this. So prototype confused me to no end when I was a new developer. I was like, why does everything keep saying prototype? Um, basically just means that this, like you can just ignore this. All right. So you don't need to type this in. It's just telling you that it's on this class, all right? And so we've got some examples here, right? So if we run this, right? So you get 123.460.00 and then 123,000.00, all right? And this is getting ran through the this function that they wrote called financial parse float x two fixed, two decimal places, right? So all of these things that are more than two decimal places or maybe a whole number that doesn't have a decimal, or I'm sorry, this does have the decimal, uh, it all gets sent to a specific form. So, right, so we can just run it without anything in there or we can run it with digits, which is the number of decimal places that we want. If you don't put anything in there, I believe it just chops it off to a whole number. So the number of digits to appear after the decimal point should have a value between zero and 100 inclusive. If the argument is omitted, it is treated as zero, right? So you'll get no decimal points. Now, this is very important. The return value is not necessarily returning a number, it's returning a string representing the given number using fixed point notation, all right? So let's go ahead and plug this in. All right, so I can do this and I can say, um, I believe it's dot two fixed. And I know that I want to do two decimal places. All right, so let's go ahead and run it. So I get 25.00 and I get 2.72. This looks good, but this is still false, right? Because with this, I am returning a string representing the given number using fixed point notation, right? And over here, I am doing strictly equal. So I am checking not just the data, but I'm also checking the type of the data, right? So if I did something like this, right? Well, I'm still getting false, false here. Um, I don't know why on that one that should show me well, uh, if I, I probably have to put it to the exact because I'm still getting the float in there. So if I do that, well, it's still still giving it to me. And so not I would have to look up why this one's still showing false. But the point is, is that we don't want to compare these strings against this. We want to figure out how to convert this string back into a number. Right. And so there's multiple different ways to do this. So again, not knowing how, how do I convert a string to a number 
and JS, right? So the, the unary plus operator will convert a string into a number. Um, the operator will go before the operand. So that's one way to do it. Parse int down here, MDM web docs, right? So parse int. So I can take a string and I can wrap it in parse int. So I could do something like this. So let's ignore these for just a second. And we'll say console.log. 75, right? And there is my string of 75. It's telling me that if I put a plus operator in here, right? Notice how it turns gold. That's forcing it to a number, right? I can also do something like this. So I can say parse int. Right, that is turning it to a number. And however, I know that I've got a floating point decimal in here. So parse int may not be the best answer, but if we look right next to it, we've got parse float, right? And so the parse float function parses a string argument and returns a floating point number, right? So there's my syntax, there's my, my parameter. I have to give it a string and then the return value is a floating point number parse from a given string or NAND, not a number, when the first non-white space character cannot be converted into a number. So let's take a look at that real quick, right? So if I say parse float, right, I still get 75, but if I do dot uh, 55 in here, right, there's my floating point number. If I were to take something like this and say Charles, where this cannot be turned into an integer or a float, it's going to return not a number, right? So this looks pretty promising to me. And personally, I like the parse float better than just using the plus sign. And both will work and they're both great, but this is explicit, right? So when I come in here, and when my code doesn't look like this necessarily, and there's code all over the place, I know that I am specifically taking this value and I'm parsing it to a flow. So I like being explicit when I write my code. So let's go ahead and do something like this. And we'll take that and that. Oops, this. And comment those. Sorry. And, and I'll explain that here in a second too. All right. So here's this. Here's a number. It's still returning false. And that's why I was getting confused when I had the, the equals instead of the strictly equals is because I've still got a console.log here and I'm returning it. So if I don't return from my function, this is just re, uh, basically resolves itself into undefined. And that's why it was um, still blowing up. So I believe I've got the right answer here. So I can take this right out of my console.log and I can just turn it into a return statement. Right, and there's my true and my true, right? And if, I want to see what it really looks like. So I could say 563. And I would expect now that I would see uh, was that 437 would be my change. Right. And so I'm getting the right calculations. And again, I like this because it's explicit, but you could absolutely, you should still get passing and get the exact same things just by using that plus sign. Right. So that just comes down to a spoil a style choice right there, but both of them are correct valid choices. Any questions on how I solve this? Did anyone else solve it a different way? So I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, how would you, if I did not know how how do you search for a function that will do that? Like, what's the, what you say, what's the keywords, for, I guess, for this solution? Yeah. So Google is good enough where I would ask it questions just like I would ask uh, a person a question, 
right? Like pretend Google is me, Charles, your intro to coding instructor, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and it, it's hard in the beginning because like you don't necessarily understand all of the terms, right? Um, so you need to know that like, this is a string, this is a string, right? And right. that these are numbers and these are floating point numbers. Uh, there'll be some wiggle room there. And like I said, when I re when I search for these, um, it's like MDN isn't always the top return. Like the, you'll get some other stuff in here, like geeks for geeks. And this is pretty good. Uh, but again, get used to MDN and finding that one resource because the other thing you can do here as well is so the first thing is you're going to Google it, right? Like, so um, how do I add, like the appropriate way is like, how do I add an element to an array, right? So like, and it's already started like in Java to a NumPy array, dictionary in Python, a list, vector in C++, an element in JavaScript, right? So an element to an array in, you can write JavaScript or you can write JS, right? And this is and this is the correct answer. You're going to use the push method, right? That's one way to do it. Now, if you don't know or if you don't remember that, you should call it an element, right? Like, how do I add something to an array in JS, right? So to add an object to an array, so like as long as you can get close like you're going to get it. And then as you get better or, right, like uh, I, I see all these things and I see it over and over again, right? Push, push, um, use push. And so again, here it is down in MDN and here's examples and here's all the different things and like, here's what it does, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first thing is, is just to Google it. And if you're not quite getting the answer you're looking for, look at the answers you're getting and see if it will help you formulate a better version of your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and the other thing too is, and I know chat GTP is like 20 bucks a month or whatever, but I'm pretty sure Google Bard is still free. Well, they call it Gemini. Or did they start charging money for it? Chat with Gemini. Jet isn't supported for this account because I'm in the corporate account. Um, let me turn to my personal account. Okay, so it is, so I'm pretty sure it's free for like a, if you've got a personal Gmail account, All right? Bard is now Gemini, All right? Like how do I add and um, how do I add something to an array in JS? thinking, right? So there's several ways to do something. Here's some examples. Um, you can actually just copy this code example, right? And this is the right way to use AI, right? Cause like this is giving you push, uh, concat, which I've never actually seen that done before. So surprise, like I learned something new today. Uh, unshift, um, splice right like uh, all of these all of these are valid ways to do it um but there's also so the, the um like this is a good way to use it like the bad way to use it would be to do something like this right like take this and copy and paste it into here and then just let the ai generate the solution for you and then copy and paste it back in and say i'm done right like and it looks like they're they're getting all sorts of crazy in here right like past that like if you're you're on a um uh like you're doing a coding application and you start throwing in like try and catch, which is a uh, 
like an actual way to throw errors and um, like protect your code. Like that's something I would expect to see from like a senior developer or someone pushing code in production. Uh, this would be like a dead giveaway that you didn't actually write this and that you just copy and pasted it straight out of um, like a, an AI chat box, right? And so like, that's not a good way to use AI because you're not learning anything here, but like asking it questions or asking it for additional examples, right? So like, okay, I get that I can use push. Can you show me some more examples, right? And I don't know if that question in the middle will throw off the AI Right, but like, okay, so here's some even more examples, right, of where push would get used, right? Like they're using it in a for each, which is a, a looping, a built-in method to loop, right? We're, we're pushing in an object, we're just pushing in, uh, like we're using it in a conditional statement. And so this is a good way to use AI, right? Like to help you learn, this is the bad way to use it. All right. And now another thing you could do that I wouldn't be totally against, right, is you could say like, you could do something like, uh, like uh, Right, do something like that and say like, hey, this is the solution I came up with. Can you explain it to me? Like if you're a little fuzzy on it or you kind of live through it and now it's going to go through and it's going to break it down for you and it's going to tell you what you're doing, right? Like, so this would be a, after you've already finished it, like, hey, how could I make this better? Like it's, it's giving you, like it's going over the test cases that you wrote um like all these different things like this is a good way to use it like to help you continue to learn just don't ask it to do the work for you right but you can ask it to look at your work you can ask it questions but also notice that like when i typed in this first question it took longer to generate this than it did for me to like google it and go to mdm and get the same answer But AI is here, it's useful for software developers, getting comfortable using it the right way is um, like, it's the way to go. I mean, it's the same thing. Like I use uh, chat GPT, like I've got lists of questions over here and I use it for hard stuff. I use it for easy stuff that I don't remember off the top of my head, right? But like, I mean, all day long, I'm asking it questions um, asking it like, what does this mean? Right. And, or like something like this, Hey, I want to return and nil if a variable is equal to zero in Ruby, just because like, I'm, I, I know how to do it, but I want to know if there's a better way to do it, like things along those lines. Right. So like, it is useful. All right. And any other questions on this one? Okay, it's 8.17. Let's take a quick break here. It'll be 8.18 by the time I'm done. Uh, let's get back here at 8.25, and then we'll go through one more challenge as a class together, and then we'll call it a night. Hey. All right, everyone, welcome back from the break. It is 8.27 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we're going to do one last challenge here, and then we're going to be done for the evening. All right, so let's see what we've got next here. All right, convert to hours. All right, yep, so I think that'll be a good one, and that'll be a good one to close out the night on. All right, so we clicked on it. We get code platoons copy. We're going to fork and run. We're going to fork it. And now we've got our own personal copy of it. 
All right. And so let's go ahead and take a look at the readme. So the instructions are write a function that takes in a number of minutes and returns the hours equivalent as a float integer. All right. So uh, 0 0.75, 1.25, 2.083. And there are no tests on this one. Uh, so we'll we'll take a look at that. Let's go ahead and grab these. Bring them over here. Um, also, while I'm doing this, a couple of things to talk about. So I had pointed out one change uh, that's different than an IDE, right? So like if we take these and we put them in something that is a, a wrapping. Um, characters such as parentheses, brackets, curly braces, uh, quotes, double quotes, back ticks. Instead of overwriting the text you've highlighted, it'll actually wrap it in the characters that you give it. Uh, there is also the ability to multi-select when you're using it. So notice how when I highlight code, it's giving me uh, another colored highlight, but it's telling me these are all the other places that this highlighted text exists. And that's just to help you when you start writing code and larger blocks of code and you're reusing variable names and functions, right? It helps you, it's just another way to identify it. Now, I believe on a PC, you can hit Control D as in Delta. On a Mac, it's Command D once you've highlighted text and you will do multi-highlight, all right? And so notice how I've got three blinking cursors here. If I start typing, Right, I'm typing on three lines. So I'm gonna grab this, go to the front, hit Shift N. I'm gonna wrap the whole thing in parens, and I'm gonna come back here and type console.log. Right, and now I basically taken all three lines of code and edited them at the same time. Now, same thing here, I'm getting this little red squiggly line and it's gonna yell at me saying, I have no idea what this is. So I'm gonna highlight these. Right, and we'll do that, All right? And so I just replaced those three fat arrows that don't do anything. They were just text used in the readme, and I've replaced them with triple equals, All right? And I've done all three of them at the same time. Again, Control D on a PC or Command D on a Mac will allow you to do multi-highlight, right? So if I do this, highlight some text, <coughs> and just make sure that when you're done highlighting, that you hit the escape key, otherwise you'll just keep typing with three different um, cursors, all right? So I hit escape and it puts me back down to normal edit mode. So I'm getting one parameter, which is going to be uh, a number. And it's the number of minutes. I have to return one param, which is also going to be a number, but it's going to be a floating point number. That is the hour representation of the minutes given. All right, we'll say C below. All right, so let's see what happens here. So first off, I want to console.log my minutes, make sure that that's what I'm getting. All right, 4575, 125, 4575, 125, I'm getting all those falses. Again, because if I do another example down here, C 
say 135. All right, I've got that, but I'm still returning undefined because I'm not returning in. All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. So uh, to convert uh, minutes to hours, then we just divide by 60 minutes in one hour. Let's see what we get here. All right, so 0.75, 1.25, false, 2.83, and then we get that rounding. All right, so we'll see if that's going to be a problem for us or not, and then 2.25. So let's go ahead and we'll take this out of the console.log and we'll move this into the return. And let's see what we get. All right, so I get a true, true, a false, and then my 2.25 here stuff. All right, so let's look at some ways that we could possibly tackle this, right? And so this one would get tricky because this is um, like technically I'm going to solve it to the tests that are out there. Like I could keep doing different numbers that give me even further decimals, right? But let's go ahead and let's take this and we'll wrap it and we'll say two fixed. And in this instance, I think we're going to need two fixed three. Right, so we get all of those falses. Let's take this out of the return for a second and do this. Whoops, this. All right, so 0 0.750, 1.25, 2.083, but we're getting the, the string representation, right? So again, we need that unary operator we need to parse a float. Uh, we need to get this back to a number, right? And so let's go ahead, <laughs> excuse me. And we'll move this back to a parse float and let's return it and let's see what we get. All right, so now I'm getting all of my troops. And the reason being is that I need to get it out to that farthest decimal. Like if I wrote one of these and I put one of the fourth decimal place because I'm two fixed three, um, it would it would basically break again because uh, I would need two fixed four. And with these, when it's 0 0.750, because I'm taking it out to the two fixed three, um, the computer is basically just dropping the zero for me behind the scenes and it's not changing anything. So even though it may look a little different, Right, so like where we get this 0 0.750, like that goes away when it's a number, right? So this would be the answer to it, right? Very similar to what we did with the, um, like the, the change, right? And so what we're seeing is these are going to start building on each other, right? So convert to hours, um, the mortgage payment, I don't usually do that one. Um, we've got a little extra time, so maybe we can take a look at that one as well. The, the other one went a little bit quicker, but this is just repetition, right? So if we look at the README, write a function that calculates the dollar amount returned in your initial investment, given an initial investment and in annual return percentage. Now, they're not asking you for how many years you've been invested. It's just like what happens after one year. And we're basically doing the same thing that we were doing with the last two. We're just now using a percentage, right? And instead of addition, uh, division on the last one, we need to do some multiplication, right? So we're doing the same thing. We're just changing it up a little bit, right? And then when we get to convert to hours and minutes, Right, so we already converted hours to minutes, or I'm sorry, minutes to hours. Now we want to convert minutes to hours and minutes, right? So almost the exact same problem, but now we've got a twist, right? So like we need to account for whole hours and separately for leftover minutes, and then we need to be able to put it in a string and so on and so forth. And like each of these are going to continue to build on the previous one and get sequentially harder. And like I said, kind of the, the capstone for this intro class is employee data, 
uh, uses objects, arrays, and loops. Uh, pretty much uses everything that you learned in the previous sessions, and we covered this on the last night of class. Um, and this one is, is the the first time I tried this problem. It, I tried to like I hadn't done the first time I taught this class. I hadn't done all of these problems on my own before class, and it hurt my feelings in front of class. Basically, like I had to stop like catch my breath like and then circle back around like work on it on my own a little bit and then come back and teach it to the class and so this this employee data one is a a difficult problem but we leave off in this class with this one and this is kind of where the application at code platoon would start at and then continue to get more difficult from there all right so this is just the on ramp for that all right so we've still got about uh, 20 minutes here. So there's uh, one other thing that I'll discuss with you uh, before I let you go. We might get out a couple minutes early tonight. Uh, is I want to address uh, like getting around in Slack and how to ask for help in Slack. Um, like I see people dropping screenshots. These are great. Um, these are readable. But the problem is, is that if... I want to grab some of your code and try it myself. Uh, I can't, right? Like I can't take this picture and feed it into code. Now, the the worst way to do something in Slack is just to copy and paste it in unformatted. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one, all right? So if you come to Slack and I just come over, and I drop this in here. I didn't even grab the whole thing. Can you copy? Right, like this is hard to read, right? Like if I'm trying to parse through code here, especially like if we get into a bigger challenge. And so what I would ask that you do is if you're asking for help and you wanna drop some code in here is that you take advantage of Slack's code formatting. And so we'll go ahead, and that is if you do three back ticks, so one, two, three, just like we're doing a string literal, you get a code box, right? You can also do it by uh, clicking this button right here, right? So code block, you can also get code. So if you just have one thing, so if I wanna do this, right, and then say, let um, my name equal Charles, right? Like, so that's just like a, a small bit of inline code. But if I've got a lot doing that triple back tick or hitting the code block and then putting it in there, when you drop this in, whoever is coming to help you, I can now grab this, I can copy and paste it into my own replet. Um, I can point this stuff out to you, all right? Now, this also has its limit. So let me delete this here real quick. All right, and let me grab. And this, this is Ruby code, but don't worry about it. Um, the example still uh, counts here. Whoops, I want. All right, here we go. So like, if I were to grab something like this and I need some help on it, like this is bigger. This is 63 lines of code, right? And 
this can be a little bit more difficult. Like even if I throw this into a code block here and it may tell me that there's too much, right? So if I hit enter here, right? Like this is still a lot to look through. And if I say, hey, you've got a problem down here around the 50th line of code, like the, this is where your problem is. And it's also all one color. Like it becomes hard to explain that to you. I mean, and so let's go ahead and delete this. And I was curious, so that I got this apply format. You can do this anytime with command shift. All right, so I think this just does the, the code again. All right, so that doesn't really do anything. Um, but, um, so let's go ahead and delete this and save it. Yeah, we'll delete it. So now if you need to do something in Slack that's a built-in command, you use the forward slash and you'll get a list of all the different tools and plugins that are done with this, um, right? The most popular is Giphy, right? We can, we can drop some memes into our, our channel. But the other thing, and specifically when you are dealing with code, the next step up from using a code block is called a snippet. And you can create a text snippet, All right? So now I'm going to dump in my 63 lines of code. I'm going to tell it, hey, I'm working with Ruby. And it's going to take a second here. And I'm going to create the snippet. And now if someone comes in here to help me, they can say, hey, Charles, line 49 is where you screwed up, right? You need to fix this line, right? And now it's not all monocolor. We're getting comments or color. Uh, we're getting it just like if we were looking at it in Replit or if we're looking at VS Code. And whoever is coming to help you troubleshoot, this makes their life all the more easier, all right? So triple back tick gives you a code block and then uh, forward slash and then start typing snippet and you can create a text snippet. And if you, and you saw it here, when I did this, there's all sorts of languages that you can do. JavaScript is one of them, right? So um, const, hello world, and you can even write code directly in here. Um, I had a question. Yes. Um, what if you get a, um, a error code um, on when you do console log uh, and it shows you the line? Would you rather have me put the error code in or copy the whole code and see where I went wrong? Both. Okay, both. Right. And so if you, if something's explicitly broken with what you're doing, um, I mean, most of the stuff that you're working on, um, like between at this point, like between myself, Francisco, uh, Chris and Guillermo, like it's crazy. I feel like I'm an old man now, but we've probably got like between the four of us, like 20 years worth of coding experience. Um, like anything you throw in here, we're probably going to be able to figure it out. But if you throw that error code in there, all the better. Right. So like, same thing here, if I do something like this, where I take my, my period out and I throw this in here and I say, hey, here's my snippet. So let's do this. And I say, snippet. And we'll say JavaScript, All right? So there's my function and we'll add a couple of new lines down here. And we'll grab this and say, copy it, so this, right? And we create the snippet. And now I can see your code. 
And I can also see the error that you're getting. Like all of that helps me out, right? Because like this is telling me line 12 is what's busted. Snippet say in line 12 right here, right? And it's even pointing at it, right? So like this is a this is a easy one. But whenever you give us this, it's uh it, it'll help us out. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then the other thing too is like uh, this helps keep everything and it's not super busy in here, um, but like channels that are busier, threads are, are super useful in keeping everything organized, right? So if you, if you ask a question and someone re replies to you, right? Like I will always reply to you in a thread, like, then don't turn around and like reply to me here and like keep the next thing going like learn how to use threads and all you have to do is like if you see that hey i wrote this message someone replied to me click on that one reply they'll open up a sidebar and we can keep typing right over here right and that helps you keep uh, like any answers that you get organized the other thing you can do is if you've got something, you get some help on something, you can take it and you can save it for later, right? So you like if you ask one of the TAs a question, you you get a response to it. You click that thing, save for later, and I don't know if you just type it in up here, yeah, save it for later. How do we say? in your sidebar. So there should be something over here that says saved for later. Over here, ah, later. All right, all right, so you click on that. And then if you go through and you have like a bunch of messages that are saved for later, you're good. And the other thing you can do too, is you can always go to yourself and basically uh, like DM yourself and have a running list of your own notes in there, right? So like I copy and paste code into my chat with myself, um, things that get passed back and forth, right? Things I wanna say, like if I were to look at like my actual work account, There I am, All right? So, I mean, like I've got notes from all sorts of stuff. Like, and this is like my grocery list, like stuff that I'm grabbing, some recipes, pictures, like all this stuff is stuff that cats, of course, that are coming in as well as like code that I save for myself for later, right? It's all, all available for me. All right, so it's 8.51. I think we're about done for the evening. Does anyone else have any questions for me before I stop recording? Quick question. I think I missed it earlier, but what's the uh, command for the parentheses? Uh, it's to put um, like a console log uh, statement or value into parentheses quickly. So anything that you highlight, right? So like if I grab this line and so whatever's highlighted when I'm inside an IDE, if I then, so if I hit just a normal letter, like if I hit the letter J, it'll replace, replace it, right? It doesn't matter. Like I'll just like a normal, like if I was in Microsoft Word or if I do a wrapping character, so quotes, um, if I grab the whole thing, if I do curly braces, no, it's not doing it because it doesn't know what to do with that, right? So curly braces, uh, square braces, quotes, uh, parens, right? Like whatever you have highlighted, it will wrap it for you. And so if you want to do something that you need to console.log, so if I say, um, like, 
two hours, right? And there's my function and I give it a thousand, right? So it's gonna run my function, but it won't show up in the console, right? So there's my four. And so I can grab this, highlight the whole thing, put it in parens, and then type console.log, right? And then that's an easy way to do it. Now I'm getting it. And same thing, if I have it multiple times, right? So if I grab something and even so, it you can only highlight up to what is the same, right? So like, if I grab this whole thing, there's nothing else that matches this whole thing. So that's all I get. But if I grab two hours, right? Notice how all of these other two hours light up. And so I can on a PC control on a Mac command, D like Delta, I can start highlighting these. Now I can go too far, right? Like I don't want all of them. I just want these down here, right? So I can take 21 through 26. So I hit uh, Command D on my Mac five times. We've got all of them highlighted. Hit Home, then hit Shift N, and I've highlighted the whole line. Wrap it in a parens, hit Home again, console.log, right? And now I've wrapped all of those lines all at the same time at one time. Right. And so that command D or control D is multi-select. And that'll be very useful, especially as you start to get writing larger chunks of code. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to stop the recording.